The Caretaker of Imagination Written by Z.R. Salcombe Illustrated by Jane Thorne And read by Z.R. Salcombe Prologue Like most children, John wanted to run away. Most children get frustrated when grown-ups insist on wasting their time with trivial matters, like room tidying or homework finishing, when their time could be much better spent studying old maps for buried treasure, or perhaps organising this week's tea party with Fluff Up the Cat, who had no say whatsoever in the choice of his name. This leaves the child no option but to grab Fluff Butt and a clean set of underwear, then steal a couple of biscuits for the road. They never get very far, however, because they soon realise, what would everyone do without them? Dad wouldn't have anyone to pretend his jokes were actually funny. Mum wouldn't have anyone to explain her square eye theory to. And Miss Riley wouldn't have anyone to give the look to when the aforementioned homework had the aforementioned tea spilt all over it. And so they would head home, conceding that the world would just have to survive another day without them. Only John was no ordinary child. In fact, he wasn't actually a child at all. He was a 42-year-old accountant with flyaway hair and boyish blue eyes. Previous to this moment, John had lived a quiet life of contentment, alone but for the company of his cat Theo, whom he cherished with the love he might otherwise have wasted on an actual human being, and the occasional visit to his sister. He never dreamed to do anything so reckless as running away, nor had he any reason to consider it. Occasionally, a niggling voice would catch him unawares, a casual inquirer, if you like, of the world unknown. And she almost wore her gorilla slippers to work, his sister said. Her daughter, Lucy, inquired as to why shoes of the fluffy nature were so terribly wrong as a delicately balanced piece of apple pie stopped mid-air on its journey towards John's mouth. The young girl had made a very good point indeed. He put his fork down and thought of all the other things he couldn't do without incurring strange looks, like having a conversation with Theo or gliding across his polished floors with freshly laundered socks. His mind began to whiz and whirl with possibilities as he fled out the door, leaving the slice of apple pie to survive another day. There was much to do before setting out on his adventure. Notes to be written, calls to be made, and a good deal of packing to be done. He packed clothes, food, toothbrush, razor, and his special edition hardcover of The Hobbit. A wild sense of liberty rushed over him, who knew what he would do next? Eat chocolate for breakfast, only brush his teeth in the morning, not brush his teeth at all. This was far too much excitement for John. So he lurched to the fridge and took a swig of milk straight from the bottle to calm his nerves. It was well past bedtime when John was ready, with a large case of his belongings, a small case of Theo's belongings, and a charge extra at checkout case of butterflies in his stomach. He wrote a letter to his sister, explaining that he was running away and to please refrain from calling the police, as he was a grown-up and could look after himself. In postscript, he added he was leaving his house and everything in it to Lucy and hoped she'd understand. He decided to give the company car to Steve from HR, whom he knew had always admired it, and left a message on Steve's voicemail informing him so. John went to bed, feeling as if the residing butterflies were celebrating Guy Fawkes early this year. The next morning, John's eyes sparkled as he remembered the treasure beneath the dusty cover in the garage. Taking a deep breath, which he immediately regretted as it resulted in a fit of coughing, he uncovered his beloved, long unused car. White racing stripes stood out against her glossy green finish, still blazing with the confidence of youthful ego, 
and he noted that the leather upholstery had retained its refined scent. He had been unwilling, unable, to part with Myrtle, and as he buckled up, Cleo seated regally beside him, there wasn't a happier man to be found.